Hello, everyone. Welcome to Mining Now. I'm your host, Jared Downey. Today we have, actually, I think this is one of my favorite names for a company, Outliers Mining Solutions. Um, I, I just like just the word outliers on it. Um, and we've got um, their founder and director, Adam Hewitt, on. He's going to be doing this episode remote. And then in studio, we have Chris McElman. He is the manager of technology and automation um, at Outliers. Do I got that right, gentlemen? All good. You got it right. Thanks for um, yeah, no, it's great to have well you here and and Adam, uh, you and uh, where are you based actually, Adam? I live in Stratford, Ontario. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, and you're you, we had some technical issues. I think you were just trying to get out of the interview. <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but you didn't realize you were up against Gowdy. She can pretty much figure out anything. <laughs> yeah, she did. <laughs> uh, no, it's great to have you both on. Of course, I'm kidding. Um, Adam, let's start with you. Can you just give us that bird's eye view of of Outliers? Sure. Yeah. So, um, you know, Outliers is a company that was formed ten years ago. Uh, there was two of us at the beginning, and one of the reasons we came together is uh, one of us had a skill set around understanding the black box of fleet management systems uh, for open pit mines, uh, and the other one of us had sort of a lot of expertise in terms of taking all the data that's uh, that's captured by these systems and then turning it into information and driving some practical and pragmatic uh, in in improvement programs so we figured that if we put these two skill sets together we'd have a unique offering uh, and it's something that we could you know start a company on and, and build and sell and we have um i want to get into just sort of some of the opportunities you saw but i, I just just one last sort of question about the founding was um was the offering that you started out those original business plans? Is it very similar to today, or did that? You know, I ask it because in our company we we did some major shifts. <laughs> um, how similar was it um, from you know day one to today? Look, I would say that uh, a lot of the key pieces are already there. Yeah, uh, at least around what we established as our service offering for the uh, the open pit division. Okay, it was just opportunities to uh, to improve and refine them and fit them into different cultures and um, operations at different stages of maturity. Um, but a lot of it, a lot of the foundation was there. It was just sort of getting out and, and finding new ways to apply it. Right. Okay. Did you, what did you see? What was the opportunity you saw? So you, you had this skill. So you and the, the other founder had the skill set uh, that sort of merged together, but what was mm-hmm. the, what was the, was there a gap in the market or was there lots of competition, but you just, you felt that together you could, you know, make inroads or sort of what was that opportunity you, you saw that made you decide to take that step? So I think there's two. One of them was the fact that, you know, these fleet management systems have been around for well over 30 years. Um, yet we haven't been to a site that was actually truly getting the full value uh, out of this technology that's, 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 that's been in place. Um, and there's also very few people out there that really have that combination of understanding, you know, the IT, the black box, the system process, but then also the people side in terms of ensuring that, you know, all those things are ticked. Uh, and you're getting full value out of this this piece of tech technology. Uh, and then the second one was, you know, this is sort of, you know, 10 years ago, and there was a, you know, a lot more data being generated uh, by mine sites, but not necessarily being turned into information. Or even if it was turned into information, it wasn't used in sort of a practical, pragmatic improvement approach um, that actually, you know, resulted in in solutions that 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 lasted and were were sustainable. You know, so those are sort of the two main uh, gaps in the market on in terms of how Outliers was originally formed. Um, I want to bring I want to bring both of you in on this com- conversation of just what is what does your team look like? Like, what are the capabilities to build a team like yours? What kind of people, like skill sets, yeah. uh, do do you need? Uh, maybe maybe Chris, actually start with you, and then yeah, absolutely. And and I would say there's kind of an underlying theme uh, where we're we're getting people from industry. So we're we're really uh, looking for people that have experience on the tools at the mine site. Um, tradition, typically mine operations. Uh, so I'd say we've got people that have started out running equipment, have worked their way up through supervision and into management, uh, and then we've got a few people with uh, an engineering background. Uh, so also operations, but more on the analytical side. Um, 
running the numbers, um, looking at things at more of a strategic level. So, right. but the I'd say the underlying theme is people who uh, have rolled up their sleeves, who got their boots wet, have uh, have been in the industry. And then what what do they? And and how does that? I I know this is almost self evident, but I think it's worth asking still. How does that translate then into when that turns around to the service you're offering? Um, I think the the impact it has is we're able to kind of establish credibility right. relatively quickly. Um, so we're not coming in and, and you don't need to explain, you know, what is a mine? How does this work? Why <laughs> why are these KPIs important? Right. Uh, we're able to really, after just a few conversations, we typically we're able to um, get a, we've got, we've been to enough mines now that there are kind of the usual suspects um, that yeah. we can usually bring to the table and say, you know, here, here are the typical things, here are the typical opportunities. Yeah. Um, but, um, what I find really interesting is, um, because we show up with people that have, you know, diverse experiences and a lot of background, um, what we can run into is we come in for one thing and mm -hmm. then we pivot and that actually isn't the thing that's going to add the most value. Right. Uh, so, so we can come in with a specific scope uh, and then, you know, five days in, eight days in. Uh, and even, it's not evident after five days, but after eight days, uh, a light bulb can go on. And the thing we we were there for is actually, you know, adding value, but there's another opportunity. So that, yeah. that's the part that I, that I really get a kick out of is the, these emergent opportunities. This is a little bit tongue in cheek, but mm -hmm. just a thought that came to my mind is that people coming out of the industry, those you're sort of looking for ways to, I was on your website. There's like, you were talking about, um, I think it was it you or Adam that wrote it. Um, there, there's a there's a like a blog on your website about like a 10 seconds accumulated yeah. over a year. We'll will make you know what that actually will equal out to. Um, so when someone comes from the mining industry, do you sort of have to retrain them to look for these areas of mismanagement of like a fleet or or, or whatnot? How do you sort of approach that? Um, because people within there's habits that develop i guess what i'm trying to say um or is that not really an existent <laughs> well uh i guess the, the way i'd frame that um we're we're tr like 10 seconds you know 10 seconds is, doesn't matter 10 seconds over and over and over again 365 <laughs> days a year is, is real money yeah um so um we're basically um with the like the the processes we've got with the tools we've got uh, we can come in and kind of make visible those 10 seconds uh, yeah. and, and identify, um, you know, are those the most important 10 seconds to work on? Right. Because typically there isn't, it isn't just the 10 seconds. There are 30, 40, 50 opportunities. Right. Um, there's basically, you know, a, a wealth of targets. Uh, so uh, to make the most, you, you can't fix them all. Uh, so really we start with prioritizing targets, uh, figuring out um, where are we going to have the most impact, where are our customers going to have the most impact by changing things. Um, and it might be 10 seconds, uh, but it might be, you might be looking at the 10 seconds and they might, the customer might have fixated on the 10 seconds and they're convinced that is their problem. Right. There might be seven minutes over there. So you, right. might, you might be focusing on, uh, can, you know, you can hear Adam <laughs> laughing, <laughs> <laughs> chuckling. Yeah. You're, you're, you're trying to, uh, you know, minimize your hanging queue and your shift change is taking 45 minutes. Yeah. Um, so you can, you can be, you know, working really hard, but on right. the wrong problem. Right. So I, I think. There's a, the initial phase really is like zoom out to 30,000 feet yeah. and figure out what to focus on and, and what the impacts are yeah. before drilling down to those 10 seconds. I guess that's a huge advantage <clears throat> to you as well, because you're working on different sites. So you are, if you're, you know, if you're just the operator at the mine, you're, you get into your little, you know, can't see the forest through the trees, right? Whereas you, your team's coming in with all, all these sites. So you can probably identify that stuff much quicker generally. Yeah, I mean, we're coming in with a you know a different set of eyes because um, yeah. things do get invisible after a while. Yeah, <laughs> um, but um, we're also coming in like we've got some toolkits that allow us to prioritize that allow us to kind of um, identify and sort these opportunities. Right, um, Adam. I just want to kind of keep on this people building uh, thing for for a moment. How did you approach that over these these ten years? Um, you know, building that team that could could deliver essentially the, the value you needed into the industry. Like one of the differentiators that we built right from the beginning um, is only uh, is only bringing on experienced people into the outliers group. 
Uh, and what that looks like is is generally a minimum of 15 years experience. And that can be, well, generally predominantly based in technical roles on site uh, or time in the field, as well as holding some uh, different leadership positions. And what that means for us is that we end up with this group of all these subject matter experts that already know what good looks like. They already understand and have lived best practice. And the challenge that it's created over the years is that now we have to teach these subject matter experts on how to be consultants. Because a lot of the time, everyone that comes into the company is a first time consultant. And it is a different skill set. You know, you have people that are used to uh, influencing change with authority. And now you need to influence change without authority, you know, so you need to modify the tactics and you also need to modify how you engage with all the different levels within a company. You know, one of the other things that's unique about the outliers team is that generally everyone can have a conversation with the GM or the COO in terms of, you know, what their top priority is, but they can also, you know, sit around the water cooler or kick rocks with a shovel or truck operator in the field. Right. And still build trust and credibility there. You know, so that's sort of another unique element in terms of the composition of the individuals that we've brought in um, is, you know, our goal is to deliver value and sustainable outcomes and build trust and credibility with our clients. Um, But that happens right from the shop floor all the way up to the senior leaders. So, Chris, you were saying about the choosing you know your 10 seconds here but it might be seven minutes over there and i like both i really hear like to hear both of your um opinions on this and then you mentioned adam about the consulting teaching people to consult i've done some consulting it's a tricky thing because you come in not in in your space um but in like business development spaces and sometimes if you got someone really focused this way, it's you. It's difficult to massage them to go. It's actually this, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and um, and that might even be something that they're proud of. That's the other thing. They, they, you might be challenging something that they. And then you said something, Adam. The uh, basically supporting without authority. I've never even thought of it that way. And that's exactly what consulting is. How do you approach that? That. Um, managing change management without technically having the authority and refocusing um the on the issues on a different issue well uh this is probably a good segue into our outliers fundamentals and values uh, <laughs> one, one of those is uh, speak straight respectfully mm. um, so i think if you're if you're able to come in as someone who is you know on on the customer side like like I'm, we're we're we have a mutual interest in solving the problem. Right, you're on the same um, team. So, so once you can once you can establish that, uh, I think people um, are going to respect that you say that you tell them you you have an ugly baby. Yeah, um, you, you, you I just to, had a baby. <laughs> I I didn't even show you a picture um, yet. Don't assume. But uh, I think um, th- that that lends a bit of credibility as well to be able to yeah. to um, you know from a fact based. Um, and with uh, the underlying goal of you know trying to add value, do the best we can with what we got. Yeah, um, I think the the speaking straight part is is a, a, a fundamental part of that. Um, can I segue over to values and talking? About yeah, values? of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so there's a, a Peter Drucker quote um, that, depending on what you read, he either said it or it's it's what he meant. Um, but basically, he said that um, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's a sort of a business trope. Adam has told this story. I'll try and relate it as best I can. But uh, the, um, the the concept, uh, so Outliers is a you know young company, small company. Um, and one of the challenges we've got is we're completely distributed. We have no office. We're fully remote. Uh, we're either working you know where we live or working on mine sites. Yeah. Uh, so it is really challenging to build and maintain and, and drive mm. a culture um, in a situation like that. Um, so fairly early on, um, Outliers uh, reached out um, to a guy named uh, Craig Clark. Uh, he runs a, an outfit called Momentum Consulting, um, and basically hired a professional to help build and develop uh, a set of fundamentals um, that basically color what we do. Um, so I was super impressed coming to Outliers, uh, like coming from, uh, I used to work over at uh, Suncor, you know, it's that 8,000, 10,000 people, like a big organization. Yeah, they're they're not um, a bad size. And so coming, <laughs> coming, coming to... Uh, a company with you know tens of people, um, I was actually you know very pleasantly surprised to see that there are some big company things happening. 
Um, so one of those is this uh, set of fundamentals we've got. I saw it. it, it yeah. I should just tell the audience, it's not like three. <laughs> it's like <laughs> it's like 20. Yeah, it's a lot of fundamentals. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and like, I, I think if you... You spend time at very at various um, you know big company mine sites. They've also spent a bunch of time um, like you know safety first. Safety is you know fundamental everywhere. Uh, but um, uh, a lot of big companies have spent some time to kind of define their cultural identity and define mm -hmm. you know what how they would like people to behave. So like uh, values, goals, attitudes, behaviors. Um, I think those are kind of the elements of, of the formal definition for culture. Yeah, and so the I would say, you know, a very, uh, an approach beyond our years uh, was setting out on purpose to define that. Um, yeah. So we've got, um, and and define and sustain and recognize and, and live those, uh, those yeah. values. Yeah. Um, Adam, let's, how did that all come about? What, how, when did that start? How, how early, you said it was momentum, Glenn? Uh, Craig Clark. Craig yeah. Clark, no, Glenn, yeah. Glenn Clark was a yeah. premier and yeah. yeah. <laughs> In VC, um, uh, when when did that um, when did you start that kind of work? That, that's it. And it, I I did notice again on your website. I noticed that oh the, they they spent some time on this because it's there's a lot like check your ego at the door. Um, we are performance biz. There's another one that uh, uh, that I thought was you know on honor commitments. It's a simple one. It's sort of self-evident, but it is different when you. It's different when you actually write it down. Yeah. And this is part. This is what we're committing to. So, Adam, when did you sort of realize it was important to get this kind of work done? Well, I think it was at the turning point when we realized that we wanted to transition from just sort of a group of professionals operating under a brand. Uh, to actually becoming a proper consulting company uh, and 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 putting in the foundation where we'd be able to sustainably grow. And you know it wasn't it was the other founder that really led the charge in this particular area. And you know the idea is is that if if you don't design and implement and start to live the culture you want, your culture is going to happen to you. And we really bought into that fact. We also knew that we can do it alone. So we did, uh, you know, heavily rely on Craig and Marlene Clark from Momentum Consulting. Uh, they've been engaged with Outliers for at least the last five years and continue to be external coaches for myself and a lot of our team members. Um, but, you know, the reason that um, the fundamentals and that culture piece has stuck with Outliers is because we actually had a plan to embed it within, within the company. You know, so in mining, uh, it's 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 really common to kick off a meeting with a safety share. Uh, so you have a safety share just to bring safety front and center and get people's minds set around safety. We do that as well, but we also include a culture share. Um, so when Outliers starts an internal meeting, we'll have our safety share and then we'll have a culture share. You know, another thing that we did to really to try and embed the fundamentals throughout the organization is uh, we have a fundamental of the week. And as a leadership mm. team, we've taken turns where every Sunday or Monday, an email comes out with the fundamental of the week. Uh, and, that, and that leader in Outliers uh, writes a little description in terms of what it means to them. Oh, I'm uh, or an anecdote that. in that terms of where they've, where they've succeeded or mm. where they've recognized yeah. another person or where they've failed. And I think we've been through uh, at least six of us now. Uh, and it's always one of the things that I look forward to to yep. start my week because, um, you know, you really start to realize that even something as simple as, you know, be accountable can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Yep. Um, so it even then, you know, it starts to continue to broaden your perspective in terms of what they mean. Another thing we've done, too, which we're really proud of is, you know, as senior leaders, we definitely strive to live them. Uh, we've all made the commitments to follow those behaviors. Um, and one, like we've had a couple, a couple examples recently where even there'll be a team member that may be struggling with, you know, a person at a client site or some particular problem or issue. And it's like, well, what do I do? And one of the first things we often say is, well, let's, let's, let's look at the fun fundamentals. 
you know, what do they tell us in terms of, you know, how, how can we use the fundamentals to guide our behavior and how we react and respond to this situation? Um, so something we're really proud of in terms of both the time and effort and investment that we've, uh, that we put into, you know, designing our, our, our culture and behaviors. I want to, I want to get into some of the, you know, the specific services you offer quite, quite quickly here. Um, but I just, I want to ask one more question is when you, because I, I was on your LinkedIn, I saw the, you know, I think you'd been with Suncor for 10 years, uh, about six years, six years. Yeah. Um, this is a fairly new role for you about a year, yeah, year and a half. You already touched on it, but how important was that seeing that, you know, a smaller company, a company that's growing, obviously has a vision to expand. Um, how important was it when making that choice? And I, I'm curious because quite often, if you know, if I'm talking to someone who's, you know, Adam, you've you built the company <laughs> with those fundamentals, that's that's one thing. It's another thing to come and go, oh, I see it in the company, which is really a nod. I, I take that as quite a nod to what you built, Adam, to go, someone comes in and they go, no, I see these values. How important was that in your decision? Um, I think it was. Uh, it definitely gave me uh, you know, some confidence that there's a, there's a growth trajectory. There's a path right. here. Like we're thinking like a big company. Yeah. Because uh, <laughs> um, yeah. So it was it was definitely part of the uh, the decision. Like for for me, Outliers is very much uh, it's a niche within a niche within a niche. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and so. Um, I, yeah, that, that's how that's how I got here is like the association with mining fleet management. Yeah, yeah, no, it just it just, just stands out to me. I mean, you make it very clear on your website. It's just it's so easy for a smaller company. We've probably been guilty of it is to just leave kick that sort of stuff down the road. You know, I know it's important, but we got to do it. You know, we'll do it next year. We'll do it next year. Um, but it really does hamper your your growth because it's such a core. You, you, it's really hard to develop a culture if you don't outline what that culture is supposed to be. Um, <laughs> but I, I should move on to to Adam. Can you sort of walk us through in a little more detail what um, some specifics of what you're offering to clients? There's, there's a bit of a, a, a list here. Um, can you just sort of walk through it a bit more detailed for us? Sure. So, uh, look, over 10 years, uh, we grew from simply supporting improvement opportunities in mine operations and rehabilitating and driving value from fleet management systems um, to growing to having five different uh, distinct divisions within the company. Uh, so each division has its own director uh, that manages those offerings and their teams. Uh, one of them is Open Pit. So Open Pit is, you know, the most mature because it was part of that origin story. Um, but it's grown now to include uh, a lot more services within the tech services space, you know, putting together management operating systems for the different time periods of mine planning, uh, working towards integrated planning in terms of bringing tech services, mobile maintenance, processing and operations all together to have a cohesive business plan. Uh, and then continuing to build and, and grow uh, upon that core offering of, you know, uh, improvements within mine operations, uh, at driving value out of fleet management systems, and, and providing some advanced training for dis, dis, dispatchers. Underground is a division that's been around for around three years now. Mm -hmm. Uh, I got to be part of one of our first flagship projects, and that was a lot of fun because it was basically sort of learning mining all over again. Uh, I'm a blue sky miner. I'm not an underground guy, but was forced to be an underground guy with a couple of our other uh, uh, under true underground experts. Um, but, you know, we've done projects where we've gone into uh, operations that have no data. Uh, we need to, you know, really rely on people and process um, because there, there just isn't that data-rich environment to, to help drive improvement. Um, and we've also worked at sites where it is a data-rich environment, you know, so the, the underground is, is something we're continuing to grow and expand. Um, and um, the, uh, the other one that's been around from the early days is our, our asset management, or now we've sort of rebranded it as maintenance and, and reliability. Uh, so we've done a lot of work there around helping establish uh, reliability programs, uh, work management, uh, working with the different CMMS uh, softwares that are in place at different mines, uh, and even some simple services as just providing uh, maintenance planners or reliability engineers, you know, to help keep uh to keep the lights on for some of our, our our key clients 
the two new ones that we've introduced over the past two years. Uh, the first is integrated operations. Uh, really fortunate to, to have brought on uh, our, our director of that division, Saad Hamid, uh, really lives the brand in terms of uh, what he's brought to that division and service offering. Uh, in his previous life, he was part of the, the three years of sort of the design, construct, implement, go live uh, of one of Canada's first uh, integrated remote operating centers. But then after all of that, he had to stick around uh, and manage it for three years after. Wow. You know, so what he brings to that particular service offering is there's lots of groups out there that tell you, okay, here's the cookie cutter, here's the design, here's what it should look like. They build it and say, okay, here's the keys, you get the value. Well, he's learned all those lessons mm-hmm. <laughs> and he knows what to do differently leading up to that go live uh, and the type of challenges that come once you actually you know, change the way people work and change the environment they work in and change the flow of communication. Uh, and then the final one is uh, our ed- education division. So there we've got two. We have mining specific Lean Six Sigma Greenbelt training. That's something we've had from the very early days. It's a you know, great program. Uh, and the other one that's really gaining a ton of steam for us, for us is, is OMS LEAD. Uh, so it's a program designed for frontline leaders. Um, you know, there's a lot of first-time supervisors, superintendents, managers in mining right now. Uh, and generally, most sites don't have a formalized training program from a leadership perspective or a behavioral perspective in terms of these new responsibilities that they've that they that they now need to take on. And the differentiator there is that uh, we've collected a whole bunch of semi-retired uh, mining prof- or mining professionals, so former GMs, COOs, managers, you know, and they're not going to give back to the industry showing sites how to use the, the you know the latest and greatest technology. But what they can do is help transfer some of those key leadership behaviors from all the lessons mm-hmm. that they've learned in their 30, 35 year long careers. Um, so that's sort of a you know high level overview of sort of the five different divisions and some well, of the service offerings that fit beneath them. So you need to be on the show, I think, five more times <laughs> to, to actually unpack it. Yeah, um, it's uh, a, yeah. Lot, a lot to unpack. That's and, a lot to yeah. unpack. <laughs> and uh, you know, and that's something too. It's 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 a really exciting time for us because you know the way we've structured it is it's essentially five small businesses within a business. Um, right. You know, so our leadership team is very entrepreneurial and positioned for a lot of growth across all five. So it's. Uh, yeah, certainly a lot to talk about. Where where where's your main focus? Uh, open pit. So okay. I I can probably unpack that a little bit. Yeah, um, I think. Uh, I mean, we're typically will uh, traditionally uh, we basically were associated with mines that had a fleet management system because if you're talking that that is a massive machine for basically instrumenting a mine and collecting data about what's going on. Yeah, um, we've kind of expanded from there, um, but the what we, and I, I would say, so we, we started technical, started analytical, and yeah. we've really kind of have more of a focus on, on process. Uh, the, the, we're talking about people, process, technology. Um, it's become a little bit more, uh, I think to quote Saad, people, people, people. <laughs> yeah, I saw that in the uh, notes, actually. So uh, <laughs> basically, it's a lot like the, uh, the, the environmental factor is basically you've got um, you know, a couple of cycles, mining's gone back and forth through, through a few cycles. Um, shaking out a lot of people. Yeah. Um, so you have s- relatively few super experienced people and a lot of people with just a few years of experience and not a whole lot in the middle. Mm. Um, so basically the, uh, a lot of the fundamental behaviors that are, you know, common sense or are common sense after you're in the industry for 10 or 15 years <laughs> are just not common sense necessarily. Right. Um, so what we, uh, what we're bringing to the table typically, um, is some advice and some perspective and some help implementing uh, what we call a a management operating system or MOS. Uh, And it's basically a collection of procedures and tools, uh, processes and tools uh, and behaviors uh, that allow you to uh, line up, maybe not, maybe optimally is a strong word, but uh, do a a better job with the existing hardware, software, people, the the cards you've been dealt. Yeah. Um, So we are, I would say our flagship kind of, uh, tool is what we call is a short interval control dashboard Uh, but that's that's the tool that's the software 
um, what we what we do uh, when we're implementing something like that is we're basically helping build a set of uh, a decision loop, a set of mm. processes that operate on the the fifteen minute time scale, on the six hour time scale, on the twelve hour time scale, um, and we've got some tools that match to each of those time scales. So uh, short interval control is a whole you know a whole industry now. <laughs> um, but uh, and I'd say our, our take. Like uh, short interval control, you know, classically comes from manufacturing, you know, stop the line, everyone look at what you're doing, look back, make a plan for looking forward, and then start the line again. Mm. Um, mining, ironically, is less of a continuous process, more of a batch process, um, and you really don't have the opportunity to just stop. Uh, so um, as opposed to, uh, you know, short an interval being three hours, I'd say in the outliers world, our interval collapses right down to essentially a haul cycle. So that might okay. be, you know, five, 10, 20 minutes. Um, and so it's almost more of a continuous process. Um, and we work, we basically provide some tools oh, see. that give visibility cycle by cycle. So it's not so much, how am I doing over three hours? Literally load by load, um, are we where we're supposed to be? Um, and so we've got some tools for that basically... Um, you, you might have a situation where things are drifting off of spec. The, the load times are going up, the spot times are going up, and it's, it's a subtle, it's, it, from load to load it's subtle, but if you look at a, five loads in a row, uh, you can see something's happening. Yeah. Um, now, the field supervisor can't see that happening. They can't really see the difference between a 5% a change in, in what's happening in the field, uh, but with the data tools we've got, um, or visualization tools we've got, uh, we can recognize if there's been if there's a trend that's starting to form, mm. um, and basically because you're looking at it in such small intervals, so you can small then, intervals and yeah. trends essentially. So, right. Um, so we're looking at it at, at a very fine scale, um, and then it's up to a dispatcher or a field supervisor or really the team of them working together um, to interpret to realize, hey, you know, we're losing altitude. Yeah, we, we've got a problem here. <laughs> um, we should uh, we should well. We need we we recognize we have a problem. We need to intervene. You know how should we intervene and to what degree? Yeah. Um, so all of that that's not. So who's making yeah. that? Who's making that recommendation when you in the first year? Let's say you're working with a company. Who's who's making that recommendation? Are, are are you as the company or are you handing that, or is it the supervisor that's? So so we're coming in and coaching basically. Okay. So the the you know a dispatcher the supervisor they're still doing all the work, um, and we're coming in and. You know, we'll pull them out for breakout sessions and, and classroom training yeah. and, and workshops, but essentially um, either in the, the control room or out in the field, uh, we're riding along yeah. uh, and providing a second set of eyes and providing some coaching. Um, but we're coaching to, typically uh, we build what's called a playbook. Um, so 80% of the responses are going to be the same thing over and over. Like you don't need, once you realize, hey, you know, the, the cable stands are in the wrong place <laughs> yeah. or like this spot time is terrible or or like there's something going on with this operator compared to the, the person the shift before yeah uh, basically many of the things that happen are the same things over and over again you know 80 percent of the time and 20 percent of the time it's something where you, you you really need to think it might be more unique um, so um, we help build a playbook um, and the idea is that becomes it's not you're not uh, it's not like painting by numbers or uh, player piano. You're, you're, um, you basically have to internalize the playbook so that when things happen, we, we short circuit that recognition right. and, and people can do the right thing um, as quickly as possible. So, um, so we, we're operating at, that's kind of what we're providing at a very short scale, like literally 15 minutes. Um, and then we've got um, <clears throat> some other dashboards and kind of, again, instruments data instrumentation so that we can see how people did um, so that um, at the end of the day uh, we can look at uh, we use what we call visual management yeah. so um, your various people within the mine operations organization they all get a KPI or set of KPIs and they have to basically at the end of the shift or um, sometime during the shift answer to those KPIs mm. um, so um, if they've been doing things right all along yeah, those KPIs should be pretty good. Uh, sometimes they're, you know, they 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 got a bad deal. They got the shovel went down. Yeah. They didn't. <laughs> they couldn't possibly accomplish what the plan originally said. Um, but at least people are are held accountable because, yeah. and and have you know they can explain what happened and explain why. Yeah. So 
um, there's there's a very small scale uh, decision loop, and then there's a, a decision loop that's happening, you know, more on the 12 hour, 24 hour scale, and then telescoping out from there, uh, we use a set of scorecards mm -hmm. basically. So again, more KPIs, um, and those would be more operator or supervisor KPIs, um, but they're they're looking at um, you know. How are these behaviors changing over time? Yeah. Um, who's the, who's in the top quartile? Who's in the bottom quartile? Like, who who do we need to coach? Um, who do we, who needs more training? Um, that's sort of what we're looking at on the on the thirty day timeline. Right. Is I I've never driven haul trucks and, and that sort of thing. I've driven forklifts. Um, and even in that, well, very much in that, forklifts actually are you. The difference between a good operator and a bad operator is very obvious, of course, because you hear the stuff breaking on a bad operator. You can hear it across the, the whole um, uh, on site. But the difference between a decent one and a good one is actually still pretty obvious. You can see someone running like a forklift, for example. You can sell quite quickly. Okay, this person, they're just at another level. Um does this allow you to like an operator, uh, like a haul truck operator? Well, something that came to my mind is it would almost you might not know. You know, if let's say someone's on a different shift, you might not see what the sort of the master operator is doing that's getting them the result. Now, are you sort of getting that data, and it allows them to sort of almost distribute out sort of their top tier abilities to people that are are decent but just don't haven't got to that next level yet. So assuming you've got a distribution of people like high performers, yeah. medium, and low, um, there's there's a few things you can do with that. Um, you can take the low performers and you know address that as a training opportunity and you know coaching and, and uh, give them a bit more attention to try them to try and raise them up you know close to the average. Uh, the top performers, uh, it's, if you start measuring them, you could actually get more sometimes out of your top performers. They might have some. Some actual the winners win like, more. It looks yeah. like they're doing really yeah. well, but actually, <laughs> yeah, um, they're doing well. Like once they've achieved mastery and they've, they're meeting the plan, they don't. They might not have to go any further. There might be more uh, opportunity there with the, with the top. They already performers. have all those tools, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and they're the, the the people that are you know they're motivated. They, yeah, they, they're. It's not it's not train training's not holding them back. The tools aren't holding them back. They, they yeah. know they know what to do. Uh, just uh, having people paying closer attention. Uh, has a tangible effect. Like yeah. same people, same gear, same systems. Yeah. Uh, but just um, holding people accountable and and recognizing when people are doing well. Like yeah. It's there's a lot of motivation there. They actually get to see those those numbers, yeah. and then and then there's those you know that mid tier. The mid tier is always an int of interest to me because the I get frustrated with the bottom tier. I'll say that. <laughs> <laughs> so that that's a. You know, there's different methods to how to sort of approach that. But that mid-tier is always fascinating to me because it's someone that maybe cares. Maybe it's someone with only four years of experience, you know, or six years. They just haven't quite got to that level. Um, but is this shared? Like, or is that up to the company? How much they share performance and things so people can actually see how people are doing? It's quite variable. I'd say that's yeah. a cultural variable. Yeah. Uh, some, so in our dashboards, we will literally anonymize the individual performance. Yeah. Um, and some places, uh, it's uh, particularly if, if performance maps to a bonus structure or compensation, uh, it can be a little more sensitive. But yeah. uh, some places it's very sensitive, and some places they it's a motivator to, right. to be able to have your name up on the wall and, and, and have your name at the top. If you can make a choice, what do you think is? Um, I guess uh, I, I think that choice really has to be uh, according to the cultural context. Yeah, like. like um, so there's yeah. not a you, there's not a really a right or wrong you don't yeah, think. It, well there is a right or wrong for the local context like you, <laughs> yeah. you can do a lot of harm <laughs> um, if you get people you could get people offside as well yeah for um, sure yeah so I, I think you you really need to read the room uh, and figure out what's you know what's appropriate so, sometimes it's going to be and people will tell you uh, but I, I think there's uh, the right answer really depends on the context yeah. What do, you, what do you think, Adam? I, it's, it's a it's an it's an yeah. interesting like the Jack Welsh thing back in the day. Of course, now GE <laughs> ran into some issues, so it, yeah. it kind of colors a lot of the stuff that he uh, preached back then. Um, but was tell people the bonuses. Tell people everybody if someone's let go. Tell exactly why they got. Tell everybody why they got let go, so everybody knows. Um, let everybody know why people are getting promoted. Like very transparent, extreme transparency. 
Um, what are your thoughts on that? It, it's a very intre- I mean, it's a discussion that'll never end because there's all sorts of opinions <laughs> on it. But what are you, just your personal thoughts on it? Well, look, one of the things when when we roll out operator scorecards at a site, uh, one of the first things we coach supervisors and superintendents on uh, is that the numbers are just the numbers. And, you know, we always ensure that there's not this, um, you know, over reliance Mm -hmm. on saying, well, look, your number is red and you're in the bottom and that means you're bad or this means you're on a, you know, new training plan Um, because the numbers are just the numbers. And where we've actually found the most value from the scorecard program is just simply putting structure in place where a supervisor needs to sit down one-on-one with their operator and have a discussion. And yes, there's some quantified metrics there that can be used as, you know, one part of the discussion, but it's really just the discussion itself and having the supervisor show that they care about their operator, they care about the performance, they care about supporting them and helping them get better. They care about their concerns. Um, You know, we had one uh, project and uh, it was in Chile at altitude, some pretty long work hours. You know, we'd wake up 4.30, hour and a half bus ride up the hill to the mine, uh, work our 13, 14 hour day, two and a, you know, hour and a half down. And one night, the, the superintendent scheduled a meeting with all the shovel operators um, because they had demanded one. And uh, we had to go there and we didn't know what the topic was going to be or what they were going to say. We thought we were going to get mobbed or lynched because we were going to start to put these scorecards out there. Mm. And the lead guy stood up and he thanked the superintendent and said, I've been working here for six years. And this is the first time that my supervisors actually came and had a conversation with me. And I found that to be so powerful. And that was just something that stuck with me Mm. um, because, you know, I do truly believe that, that that's where the actual value comes from. Is, is having the supervisors show that they care, show that they're a support, uh, and that, you know, they, they listen to their concerns. Yeah. I, I would love to be a fly on the wall to a company that is not transparent with that and then tries to make that shift over because <laughs> that that is a dance all in itself. And I'm sure you've seen that, though. I'm sure you've seen companies that went, okay, we want to shift culture, yeah, and we're going to use your platform and your services to do that. And I think the, you know, we're, we're working in industrial environments We're we're working, you know, it's all the technology and the iron and the rock is front and center, um, making those changes, uh, basically, uh, it's, um, it's a change management exercise. Yeah. Like, like it, it's, there's a buy-in, you need buy-in. Um, and, and that's not necessarily like a linear path to figure yeah. out what, what do you need to do? Like what is important in this context? <laughs> right. Uh, what is going to, you know, what is driving people and what's going to move the needle. Like, and, um, you know, sometimes there, there's nothing there. <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> like, like, um, there are, you can get to a situation where, you know, there's a specific objective and this is not feasible. It's too hard. It, like, it's not, right. um, the amount of effort required. Um, there's probably another opportunity that's going to achieve, improve value, achieve right. gains. Like, uh, not every one of those cultural problems, I think, is solvable economically. Right. No, that's a very interesting <laughs> yeah. thing that sometimes, because it would just cause such a disruption, yeah. um, especially if people have been there a long time. Like, you have to assess that and be very careful because all of a sudden there's a new idea, a new concept. Maybe it's even backed up, like you're saying, Adam, the, the numbers are the numbers. Like, maybe it's yeah. even backed up by numbers, but holistically, you have to go, okay. Can we do this? <laughs> can yeah. we disrupt <laughs> can, can, everything? Well, yeah. Can we do it? Is it worth it? And can it be sustained? Like, is there right. is there an exit strategy? Is there a path that yeah. that if you come back in two years, that behavior is still going to be there? Whatever you've tried to yeah. to implement. I would love. I just it's. I, I'm surprised I've never thought of it. I would love one day. Hopefully, you get great results from this episode. I would love one day <laughs> to w- have episode that's done like a three part series, but over like two years so but with a client bring a client in for the first where we're where, what you're starting with this conversation and then a couple and then yeah. about a year later and then another one like a third year later to go okay yeah how did that all get managed it'd be very interesting it, it would allow me to be a fly on the wall this is just for selfish reasons <laughs> <laughs> um 
but uh, I guess Adam, just before we wrap up, I'd like to know where where do you sort of see um, for for outliers? Where where sort of the vision? You touched on it a little bit, um, kind of going through the services and that, but but just to sort of wrap up, where do you where where's the focus on for the next you know couple years or even the next year out, whatever whatever you want to touch on? Um, but where are you sort of taking the company? Well, look, uh, 2023 was a bit of a unusual year for us where it went through a period of sort of, you know, recover, stabilizing, preparing for growth. Mm. Uh, and now we're sort of in the best position that we've ever been in in the past 10 years uh, across all five divisions. Um, and right now we're sort of at the point of really trying to understand the potential of, of what we currently have. Um, you know, we certainly see a lot of growth around, uh, our leadership program, uh, starting to get some pretty heavy adoption and you know, starting to get build quite a, a solid rep reputation. Uh, and it's also starting to move more globally. We ran two sessions in Africa last year. Uh, we're doing one in, uh, we'll be doing one in Australia and one in South America this year as well. well. Uh, and then in, 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 Integrated operations, another one. You know, we had some large projects in 2022, um, and we've got quite a full pipeline for us here moving into 2024. Uh, but again, just you know, continuing to to build that brand around having these differentiators, where you know our team actually has the expertise. We've actually been in their shoes. We've actually had to, you know, deal with the outcomes of the solutions that consultants provide, uh, and we can help partner navigate those to ensure that. The outcomes are, uh, you know, adding the value that was identified and, and, and also, you know, very importantly, su su sustainable. Um, you know, a big focus for us moving into this year is going to be our, our geographic expansion. Mm -hmm. You know, over 10 years and with most of our team being in Canada, I think we've serviced close to 70% of the open pit mines here in Canada. Wow. Uh, so if we want that division to grow, we got to, you know, get out of Canada. Yeah. Uh, so we already had a big flagship project in Australia last year. Uh, we've already got some identified and just looking to schedule some of the next ones in South America. Um, but, you know, that's sort of the future for us here in, in, in 2024 as, as a company is starting to build our presence in, you know, the APAC region, um, setting up in Australia, uh, as well as South America with, uh, La, LATAM, uh, and then continuing to strengthen our base here in North, North America. Yeah. You know, cause one of the things they're starting to realize as a company is, you know, I, I firmly believe that sort of the growth and success of outliers is not going to be limited uh, by our ability to, you know, engage with new clients. Um, we already know our pipelines there um, with, you know, sort of the brand and repeat clients uh, that we've had over the past few years. Uh, it's it's going to be our ability to attract and retain top talent. Right. Um, and, you know, this is something that, you know, also ties right back to that conversation we had around the, uh, the fundamentals and culture, you know, because I think this is, you know, a differentiator in terms of what the experience can be like, you know, working with an outliers. You know, we, we do a, uh, an annual offsite each year where we bring the full team together. Uh, we did that in Cancun in the second week of January. So we had 26 people come together and uh and one of the things i always find the most incredible is that you've got 26 people some of them only see each other in person once a year at these events but everyone in the company goes out of their way mm -hmm. to spend one-on-one -on -one time with every other individual and you know you'd swear that our team the entire team has been working together in the same office for the past 10 years yeah uh, in terms of how engaged and close and connected the the group the group has uh, has has become well thanks so, a lot for uh, saying that because now my, my, my team's going to hear that and they'll go yeah uh, cancun we should adopt <laughs> you want to adopt everything else they're doing adopt that one <laughs> That's well, the reason we do King June, it's actually less expensive for us to go to an all inclusive because yeah. you know, we've got team members in Australia and Argentina right. and yeah. Spain. And so <laughs> well, <laughs> it sounds glamorous, but it's actually a little bit of a cost cost savings measure. <laughs> well, but it, and yet it's still Cancun. It's a trip to Cancun. So, <laughs> gentlemen, right. thank you so much for doing this interview. Um, I feel, I, I hope I, I served the the intro to your company. I, I feel like 
Um, I mean, how long have we been going here? Not, <laughs> I feel like we put a kind of a small dent in what you actually do. Um, so, but I, I hope as an intro to the audience, um, we service that. Um, and it, it's exciting. It's always fun when we have a founder on, um, also someone that's not, has it, you know, he hasn't been with the company for 10 years. So it's sort of a fresh perspective. It's, it's kind of a nice combo on the show, actually. Um, so thank you very much. And I certainly hope this is not the last time uh, we do an episode with you. <laughs> Thanks so much, Jerry. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks. And thank you, everybody, for watching. Um, Outliers also has a good YouTube channel. Uh, I was on that today. Uh, we'll put the link in the description. Of course, their website and LinkedIn and, and both both guests will have, you can connect with them directly on LinkedIn, in the description as well. Um, but check out their YouTube channel. They've got some interesting stuff. So thank you for watching, everybody. Thank for all the support. And we will see you on the next episode of Mining Now.